going to give a few minutes for everybody to come in while I get while I finalize getting ready. Today is a very important topic. Um, is one that is often overlooked. Um, you know, most of us got into this because we wanted to buy back time. And if you essentially don't actually have a system in place, you don't have uh, a structure in place, you will always be a buyer. You will always be coordinating, um, you know, deals and stuff like that. And so, you know, we're going to be covering kind of what we call step two in our RM machines uh, system. I got uh, Saul here, so I'll just promote you to Palace in case you want to join in. Um, and so, you know, as we scale our businesses, as we want to actually, you know, get our time back, it's pretty much impossible to do it without people, right? Without people. And so today's all about step three on this journey of, um, you know, scaling. And I'm going to be sharing with you kind of, you know, a couple of things that I've learned uh, with essentially working less and making the same or more, really. Um, if you think about leverage, we leverage software, we leverage technology. And then the other piece of leveraging is leveraging human capital, leveraging people. And, you know, after the pandemic or whatever you want to call it, the fact is that everybody got used to working out of their house and there's no reason why, you know, you cannot run your business, even real estate out of your house and actually do negotiations over the phone. We're going to be covering um, a lot of things here, but the focus of today is step number three, which is closer and coordination roles. These are the main two roles that you want to hire for. Um, as soon as possible and, and coordination being the first one and then closer. And so here's the agenda for today. As always, I try to keep it short, uh, simple and sweet so that it actually makes sense for everybody. So let me go ahead and get this set up so we can have a guide um, as to what we're going to be covering today. These are some of the questions and you guys can feel free to raise in, you know, in the chat, uh, you know, uh, any questions that you guys may have, I'm more than happy to cover those. So with that said, here's the agenda for today. Uh, let me see. Here's the agenda for today. Let's see. I get that right. One sec. Sorry. Figuring out the Zoom. I guess they always do a, an update. There you go. Okay. Desktop is just better. So here's the agenda for today. Okay. The goal when we got into this was not to work like crazy, to miss out on dinners, to miss out on weekends. Um, the goal is to buy back time. There's a difference between earning the income and owning the business. And the hardest thing to do is to be in the business and not have a vision of how to actually work on the business. And I've pivoted, I've had to downsize multiple times, I've scaled up as well. I'm just sharing with everybody here kind of what I see that works, at least right now. And, you know, kind of what the sequence is on hiring, because you have to keep your costs under control. Um, and we make the money on the buy. So today, here's the agenda. Buyback time with virtual closers and coordinators. How to hire coordinators and closers. We're going to talk about um, where to get them, how to get them, um, how to interview for them. And no worries, I've got a bunch of resources that I will be sharing as part of this workshop when I push out the course into the community. So you're going to be ha having access to a lot of this. And this is more for those that want to kind of DIY, you know, do it yourself. Of course, um, you know, the pitch here is that we do have the licenses that we do a lot of this for you, depending on where you're at. But this is something that you can do yourself, right? So how to hire coordinators and closers. We're going to talk about locations. We're going to talk about interview questions, kind of pay range as well. Then also how to train the coordinators and closers. And then how to performance manage coordinators and closers. If you can't get these three things correct, you will never be able to scale to work less in your business. Now, my goal is to spend in my business probably about you know, an hour or two a day, 
And depending if for some, like if for some reason, you know, employees, they do get sick um, or for some reason they have power outages or you have a rotation on sales, that does happen. But I find that the perfect goal is having three closers and one coordinator. If you can have three closers and one coordinator, you're golden. But you should never hire a closer without your sales process actually being in place, okay? So how to hire coordinators and closers. The first hire should be a coordinator, okay? The first hire should be a coordinator. I'm going to take you through behind the scenes real quick. Um, kind of what are some of the key roles for a coordinator for us? Um, so you understand, you know, what they do, um, you understand what they don't do. And, you know, hopefully it shines a light because it's some people call it transaction coordinator, but the way that I like to run it, the coordinator does a lot more than just transaction coordination. I mean, the escrow officer or the attorney's assistant should be able to match a lot of the escrow piece. But the coordinator is really the one that buys back a lot of time and, and the sooner. So this should be definitely your first hire um, when you are trying to scale up. So what are some of the key responsibilities of the coordinator? They manage all your paper lead credit management requests, all right? They provide a five-star experience to your sellers. And I'll show you how they fall in the pipeline and how we do things. The coordinator is the glue. They're the glue between the seller, the title company, the buyer agent or the buyer, and any field activities. They are the time-heavy activities to make sure that communication is going on on a weekly and on a daily basis with all the parties involved, right? So they make sure that they take care of your paper lead credit request because if you use paper lead, like, you know, I advise to do many times um, just to guarantee a steady flow of leads. You know, if you're not watching your credits, you're not going to be profitable. All right. They also want to make sure you want to make sure it's a customer service role. So it shouldn't be somebody that's afraid to be on the phone. It doesn't necessarily have to be a closer, but it should be somebody that can control difficult situations and mitigate difficult situations. OK. And so it's a customer service rep, right? They may not have the negotiation skills of a closer, but the goal is that they provide a five-star experience. So you end up with five stars for your brand, okay? They manage, as I mentioned, escrow communication and progress promptly with title, escrow officers, sellers, buyers, and agents. They manage the field vendors, okay? So what do I talk about field vendors? We're going to talk about the stages on the pipeline, but essentially once the property is on their contract, the coordinator is the one that takes over, okay? The coordinator is the one that takes over. Um, they are keeping track of the cost. So, you know, if you're no-baiting, if you are, um, you know, carrying some costs with the property, they're bookkeeping essentially for that transaction. And they make sure that access is up and running or, or, or is made available, you know, proactively, all right? They also, so this is why I don't call them transaction coordinators. They also support acquisitions, okay? They support acquisitions because if you're the closer or you have closers, the coordinator is looking at the new leads coming in and they're calling them at the four minute mark. So if your closers are busy doing deals because these sellers, you need time with them on the phone and it's a lot of psychology involved with it. It's a lot of time. The one thing you don't want to lose is speed to lead. And so the coordinator is there multitasking. They're a multitasking person. They have to have some social phone skills as well, um, you know, for, for that type of conversation. And they support dispositions, okay? So how do they support dispositions? Well, because with te today's technology and equity protection innovations and all that stuff, or if you have a, a cash buyer list, once you blast out, you're going to get a bunch of inquiries. So you should have a template, and I'll show you behind the scenes kind of an hours, that takes care of 90% of the questions that, silly questions that people have. So the more prepared you are when you list a property or when you blast the property, the more able the coordinator is able just to field the questions. And their job is to just go ahead and progress the dispo site. I'll show you kind of 
what that looks like, right? So with that said, you know, what are some of their KPIs since we're on the topic? Their KPIs, you want to be getting five-star reviews in your Google profile. Uh, you want to make sure that deals are getting progressed. So on a daily basis, the coordinators are a squeaky wheel. I tell the coordinators, you are a squeaky wheel. You need to be always asking what's next, what's next, what's next, what's next. It's a very different skill set than a closer, but it's very time consuming and it definitely should be your first hire, okay? So they want to make sure that speed to lead is less than five minutes for new seller leads. And, you know, that the PPL credit ratio should be about 50% or more. At least that's what, what we've seen, okay? And so, you know, with that said, uh, let's kind of take a look at how it looks in practice um, in terms of a coordinator. I'll show you a couple of examples here, kind of like the stages of the pipeline of how we, you know, how we run things. So, for example, here, let me show you. Da, da, da. So you can see here, so here's our pipeline and kind of things flow from left to right. So a new lead comes in, right? And our system is seeking an appointment for all of our closers, right? So you'll notice at the top header that it says all. So that means that both coordinators and closers should be contacting them, right? Because they're contacting them through dialers, like literally like automated dialers. And that's all in the system. And so the idea is to get a new seller directly. Always the goal is to get them to cash out consultation, negotiations, right? Like this stage right here is where the money is made at. You can see my face right here, one of them, because my, one of my closers was out sick. But the coordinator takes it over from title due diligence. So once the contract is in, the coordinator owns the title due diligence, the field due diligence, when it's listed, when it's sale pending. Uh, if it's equity protection or if it's sale pending assignment and then close getting a five-star review, okay? And so this is key because you want to have clear barriers as to who does what and who's accountable what and how can we actually, you know, support the closers better. And so they work in sync. The, the, the coordinators and the closers, they work together. This is on the acquisition side. On the dispo side, for example, you have new agent inquiries, agents that are uh, registered. So what that means is that, for example, we have a deal right now. And so our system automatically, once the agents register, they automatically get a link sent, which automatically goes ahead and sends them an email with all of the details, right? Like, hey, here's a virtual 3D tour of the house. Here's the seller's disclosure. Here's like absolutely everything. So I'm not having to manage or the closers are not having to manage all these silly questions that people come up with when you're dispoing. And so this is what we call a buyer packet, okay? And you wanna have that already built in in your pipeline. Now, again, this is all built into the RM machine system, but you can do this on your own on other systems as well, right? If, if, if they have the tech. And so the idea here is new inquiry, once a new inquiry comes in, the coordinator, you can see that it says coordinator, 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 coordinator. The dispo manager, the sales manager hat only comes in when an offer is being negotiated, meaning that an offer is being worked through, right? And so the goal is to have the coordinators manage the burden of these calls, of these text messages, blah, 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 all the way through sale pending. OK, and so, you know, that's that's one aspect of it. Now, you may be wondering, OK, so they're doing um, you may be thinking like, OK, so they're doing coordination with title. They're doing coordination with buyer agents. How exactly is all this happening on a day to day, you know, day to day basis? So what we've done is essentially we've created, obviously, again, not really pitch, but just showing you guys kind of what we have. So you know, we have these dialers. So we have different dialers where the setters or coordinators and closers, they're all calling them. And they're all calling them based on the automations that are here. And all that to say, not to overwhelm everybody, but there has to be a flow for your business because if not, you're going to be doing everything, right? You're absolutely going to be doing everything. And so going back to the agenda here, the coordinators, <clears throat> Their main goal is to make sure that the closers are closing. 
Like that's their main goal, that the acquisition closers are closing and that the Dispo sales manager is negotiating the sale. All of the uh, appointment setting for buyer agents, for buyers, for inspections, for pictures, um, calling leads. So like, for example, if you have, uh, you know, leads coming in, if the closers are already busy with all of their appointments, the coordinator is sitting there looking at their Slack channel um, just looking at it and saying, hey, like, I'm about to, call, you know, this lead came in. So, like, let's say that a new lead came in and you can see in our system, like, hey, nobody's calling and nobody's calling it. The goal is that they are essentially um, keeping the uh, speed to lead low, right? We want to make sure that our uh, leads are getting called fast. So we track that um, through our dashboard here. We track it, sellers not contacted within five minutes, right? So, you know, the goal is that, hey, how how is our speed to lead coming in, right? Are we, you know, like you can see right here that we had a lot of leads, it seems, and sometimes they do come overnight. So our AI bot may be able to schedule it if they text and, you know, are okay with texting. But the goal is that the, if you are solo right now, my absolute... um advice should be that you you should hire a coordinator just to buy more more time back because it's going to buy you more time to be able to negotiate and make the money now how to hire or where to hire them um there's agencies out there i'm not going to endorse any of them you know we um we we do that as part of our REM machines license we do place coordinators and closers um, you can do agencies, you can do Upwork. What does it cost with an agency? Typically, to place one person with an agency, it can range anywhere between 2500 to 4000 on the expensive side if they're helping you place a, a, a closer or even a coordinator sometimes. With Upwork, you might get lucky. The issue is that you're just going to have to spend a lot of time, you know, interviewing a lot of people. But, you know, with that said, I've got a couple of questions that I like to use whenever I'm interviewing them, um, you know, before placing them, actually just place a closer today. Now, before we get too ahead of it, you know, um, in terms of the questions, we're going to talk about closers. So what is the job of the closer? The job of the closer should not be to, you know, coordinate stuff. The job of the closer should be to literally negotiate deals over the phone. And if you are eyeball to eyeball, belly to belly, they should be able to negotiate deals over the phone that you're within 10 to 20% of where you need to be before going to the appointment, saving yourself a lot of time. Closers are a special breed. Um, they have to be money hungry. Um you know, they can be kind of a nonchalant person and kind of low energy. In our top of sale, in our top of demographic, they have to be uh, essentially wolves in sheep's clothing, right? They have to do consultative selling. You guys have seen the Bentley script, kind of how that works. And so for a closer, you know, you need to have some things when you're having a conversation with them and interviewing them. So for example, Here's our core values and our mission. We help residential motivated sellers get an easy out of the sale. You need to be able to spell out what your company mission is. What are your company's core values? So my responsibility, my duty, open transparent conversations, vested interest in team success, excellence survives mediocre dice. Why? Because that sets the tone. You want to be able to set the tone with whoever you hire because you can't expect them to go above your standard. Right. And so, you know, you can, you know, and again, as part of this, you'll be able to get access to some resources, but it does make sense for you to kind of think about who you want working with you and what the attitude and the proactiveness you need. Because I will tell you, closing motivated sellers, although people will say, you know, yeah, close life, blah, blah, blah. We'll ask him how, how many deals actually go to the finish line. Right. And so you need to have a sniper, you need to have somebody that actually is money hungry and that is self-accountable and that's resourceful. So it's not super, you know, it's it's easier to find a coordinator. I have trained coordinators all the way to closers, but you need that drive and you need that hunger. And, um, you know, what are some of the responsibilities and what's the role? So they negotiate and acquire 
purchase and sales contract signatures for motivated sellers that result in eight times marketing spend, net revenue, utilizing our cash offer system. So you always want to be able to tell somebody like, hey, here is your number. Like you need to be bringing eight times whatever I'm spending on marketing with you. And at least, you know, uh, eight times whatever you're costing the company. You need to think about what's your number. And in, in our case, a minimum of eight times. And that is very doable. I've seen this, right? Um, and honestly, with with the pay structure that I'm suggesting you guys have here, it should be above that, to be honest with you. What are some of the responsibilities? Well, I don't believe in this whole lead manager to closer bullshit, okay? That's just not me. I think a motivated seller gets dissuaded whenever they're talking with three different people. I believe that closer should be contacting the lead firsthand if possible. Of course, we have the coordinators um, trying to back them up because as soon as a lead comes in, we want to grab their attention. We don't want them filling out more forms. We don't want them going out anywhere. We don't want them you know, getting other offers. It is an aggressive you know, top of sale. And so the idea is that um, the closers, it, it, it's it's not like we're in a business where these people have their life together and you can say, okay, I'll talk to you Thursday at 2 p.m. or Friday at 2 p.m. That's just very rare. Their show up rate is pretty horrible. And so I always tell my closers, you're literally herding squirrels, okay? Sometimes we do have people that do have their life in order and very easy, but that's not the norm. And because that is not the norm, we have to adjust accordingly. So what do I mean by this? They have to be aggressive in terms of they don't, you have to have a system and you, and they need to know what they need to do every single point. And they make their money with outbound calls and with talk time. So some minimum KPIs, they should be making at least 80 outbound calls a day. And they should be shooting for uh, two hours talk time, okay? That's what they should be shooting for. Eight, 80, 80 calls uh, in the system. These are not cold calls. I'm talking about leads in your system and two hours talk time. Um, any lead that actually stays on the phone and is willing to go through the conversation, you should be actually doing the Bentley script process, price anchoring them, getting them a little offer, and then getting them to renegotiate. That's something that we've tweaked this year. Um, if you follow or being with me for a while, you know, our goal is that whenever we're having the conversation and we're in that fork of the road of either a lay down or a non lay down, if it's a non lay down, we're essentially going to play deaf on their asking price. And they should be actually getting off of the hold and saying, hey, congratulations, got an offer for you. It's much higher than I expected. Let me recap it. Are you by your email? And you knowing that they're going to say no, you should be ready with low comps. You should be ready with your retail versus cash offer to start the conversation. Because with the non-laydown, that's where the conversation starts. It's at the no, right? And kind of putting those seeds in to actually get a deal done, okay? So, you know, uh, what the closer should be doing, they should be talking with sellers. They should be uh, calling them. Um, I'm not a big fan of having like a bunch of lead managers setting up appointments because I've just seen that the demographic that uh, we deal with, um, the appointment show up rate is not necessarily great. And so we set appointments, we set follow ups just to grab their attention. That's really the goal. The intent is to grab their attention so that we can actually be the ones that they're talking with. Because eventually, like, let's say you're shopping for a car. It gets to the point that you get tired of talking with five to 10 different salespeople around the car and the pickup truck that you want to buy, right? And so I don't know if that makes sense. I see a question here. How many leads are needed per day? Do you need daily to get to 85 dials per day? So in reality, um, I would say that a healthy, the thing is that it snowballs. So uh, that's what I've seen. I don't think that a good closer, especially when you snowball and you build that lead flow, you don't want them to be overwhelmed with leads because if you put out, if you just give them a bunch of leads, they just start rushing on the phone and they don't, their conversions go down. So my suggestion is probably around four to five a day is a healthy, 
because what happens is out of those four or five that come in today, some of them don't answer. They're not able to pick up. And then, then tomorrow you have another 10, right? And then you have 15 and it keeps snowballing and snowballing and snowballing. So what I've seen work is four to five per acquisition closer. Um, you know how it is. Some days you're going to get one or two. Other days you might get eight. But what, I, what, what you want to strive for that I've seen is four to five max per closer because it does snowball and there are some busier days than others. The other piece is around contact time. Um, our, our best contact times is kind of like 11 a.m. all the way through like 7 p.m. And so I want to encourage everybody in the community to start thinking like a business owner. Like, you know, you, like I said on the Zoom description, it's like you've got to start thinking about having your ass at supper at the dinner table without worrying, oh, there's a new lead coming in, right? And so I uh, just, you know, speak from, right, from experience and from the heart here. So uh, with that said, so like these appointments are coming in and the guys, you know, get busy. And so the business is, is simple. Some people do like flipping and construction, all this stuff. That's a whole nother beast. Like that's a whole nother beast. Right now we're strictly talking we're equity trading. That's what we do in house buying. We equity trade. We buy at a low price. We sell at a higher price, right? So, so okay. So going back to um, these, right? So these are the two roles on um, that we're covering on step three to actually have a machine going that can actually spit out deals with you know less involvement of your time, okay? And so. Um, couple of questions that I like to ask, obviously you, you guys will have access to this to kind of copy and paste. So whether you're doing an agency type of setup or you're doing, you know, Upwork interviews, the first question that I always like to ask is what was the last nonfiction book that you read or listened to? And what was it about? This is a key question because a, a, a player, an A player person will answer with, I read this book about you know, self-improvement. I read this book about Napoleon Hill. I read this book uh, about sales. What a B or C player will say is, oh, I read this comic book or like, you know, this fantasy book. But, so self-improvement is a huge signal of somebody that is invested in improving and upsetting their skill. If you listen to Jim Ron. You know, the late Jim Brown, one of the things that he said is work, work harder on yourself than on your job. And so this is a key indication of that itself. So what was the last nonfiction book that you read or listened to and what was it about? That's that tells me right off the bat if, the, if this person is looking to get self-improvement. OK, and the second key question is uh, that, that I like to say it is we are very results driven and objective organization. How do you manage constructive criticism? What can you tell me about the last constructive criticism you receive at your own previous roles. If they cannot tell you, if they cannot come up with a scenario where they were criticized, they're lying or they're too stubborn to admit it, right? So I want to hear, yeah, you know, for example, I was having the sales call and I screwed up and my supervisor gave me this coaching. You want them, and it, this, this goes for both closers and coordinators, actually. Um, where would you like to be in five years? What are your medium and long-term goals? So as you hire, you want to have people that have a drive more than clocking in and clocking out, right? And so, for example, I share a vision with people that come on board, right? Because what's what's going to hold them from just jumping to another job after, you know, I've introduced them to all of our systems, have had people on board and train them. You know, it's important to understand where are you going? Where would you like to be? And see if their vision is aligned with what you could potentially provide them, right? Because we're, we're all ego-driven. So this is a good segue to figure out, okay, you say you want your own business. Excellent. Well, you know what? I have plans of expanding territories or I'd like to expand to this other state. That could fit, right? Depending on how well you do. And if you can actually lead that team, you can have some profit share, right? And again, a lot of people kind of subestimate, you know, they're, they're underestimate, you know, uh, remote workers. There's a lot of great hustlers out there 
that you know have a lot of work ethic and discipline and can get a lot done. Um, what did you not like about your previous job or roles? What did you like about your previous role? So for example, if you're hiring somebody for the coordinator role and they're just very sales driven and they don't, they're not good with calendars, they're not good with docu signs, they're not good with crossing the T's, dotting their I's, their English is horrible, that may be a red flag, right? So you want to make sure that they also enjoy what they're about to do. And you want to be very upfront with the type of role that they're going to be doing so they know what to expect. What you don't want is hire wrong, spend three to four weeks, and then have a no-show when you've already spent money on marketing, okay? And you've already spent resources in onboarding and they're just not showing up, okay? You want to share with them, this is huge. You want to share with them your core values, right? So in an interview that I had, there's this lady that she was, uh, I think she was from Chile. And really her priority was not money. Her priority was uh, becoming a champion for jujitsu. And I was like, I'm rooting for you, but that's not what the company needs. So you need to be able to articulate clearly, okay, what is important for the company right now? And for this niche, for what we do, sales is what we, you know, live and breathe, right? And die by. So you should always ask them, what other questions should I ask that I have not yet? I like that question a lot because it makes them think and ponder what else they should share with you, okay? And obviously what sort of questions you have for me. Another thing that we implemented is, hey, let's do a little bit of a texting question. You can do this via Google Meet or Zoom, just like this. And you can just go ahead, but... I suggest that you do it live and you say a simple text texting question because we text a lot with our sellers. We text a lot with our buyers. And so we need to be able to um, understand, you know, if they can text and how good is their English, right? If we're not sure about that, then that's an issue. So I just, you know, ask them a couple of questions via texting just to see what can you pay um, these roles? So for a closer, you know, anywhere between $8 to 10 hour, to ten an hour for them being a rock star. In terms of commission, it could fluctuate anywhere between 3 to 10%. What I suggest you guys do as quote unquote business owners, right, is on the commission side, on the gross, you deduct uh, all the field expenses and you deduct a marketing recapture fee. Because we have to always prioritize marketing we always have to prioritize lead flow. And so the way that you want to paint that vision is, listen, we don't want to be closing two to three deals. We want to be closing 10 to 15 deals, right? That's where we want to be at. And so if you if you don't prioritize marketing, then you know if for some reason you have contract fall through, whether it's because the buyer got delayed or title issues or whatever, you always want to have a pipeline full of leads and calendars. Um, you don't want to be waking up to crickets, okay? So does that make sense? Any questions? I mean, I kind of covered quite a bit here of how to hire uh, coordinators and closers, but if you guys have any other questions, uh, feel free to uh, drop them off here, okay? Um, with that said, let's go to how to train coordinators and closers. I'm, I like to keep it very, very simple. I literally have videos on Zoom uh, training right, another um, closer and giving them examples and giving them a ramp up plan, right? Giving them a ramp up plan as to what they're supposed to be achieving. So for example, on a closer, month one, weeks one through two, what should they, do? should they be doing? They should be appointment setting. They're getting used to the CRM. They're get, you know, we're gonna be doing some role playing. Um, the goal is that they've, they've actually set 10 appointments in their first you know, two weeks, maybe even more. Um, this is kind of a baseline just to get them warmed up. Um, again, this is for closers. Now for weeks two to four, they get in certain to lead rotation and I want them to go ahead and get a signed purchase agreement for evaluation, like a signed PSA. Why? Because I don't want them uh, overthinking. And how we do the sales process is we go ahead and have the closers analyze and self underwrite the deal and they bring it already signed by the seller first. 
The only way they're going to learn is by doing. If you start trying to have them underwrite deals perfectly right off the bat, it's going to be super hard, right? And you're just going to stress them out. So you should say from the get go, and actually sometimes being kind of fresh is great because they take more time on the conversation. They're not jumping to price. They are more curious with the seller They spend more time with the seller on the phone. And so the goal should be one signed purchase agreement in the first month. Now I will say before you hire a closer right off the bat, you know, there is going to be investment in marketing that they're going to screw up. They're going to screw up some calls. You know, they're going to get used to your sales process. And right off the bat, when they come in, I tell them, I want you to make love to that Bentley script. You should be making love to that Bentley script day and night, taking it to the shower, wherever you're going, the park. I don't give a shit. Just go ahead and go to the go everywhere with it because you need to learn it and breathe it because that's going to, that's that's the process that we use to close. So whatever process you use to close, they need to be intimately uh, aware of it. Okay. Month two, they should be getting two approved contracts. I will tell you, rock stars may even get four, okay? But what this is going to allow them to do is to learn by doing. There's only so much videos. There's only so much, you know, uh, shadowing. They got to fail forward. You have to allow them to fail forward. Month three, okay, they should have had four approved contracts and they should have closed one contract. So one of those contracts that came in, they should have closed already, right? Month four, they should have been bringing the business a six ROI. Month five, seven ROI. Month six, eight ROI. Very doable. I've had people do eight ROI um, in the three month mark, kind of at a rock star level, right? So I hope that that kind of makes sense. So with that said, you need an onboarding document. You need an onboarding document with Zoom recordings, that they can follow along. You want to be role playing. You want to be showing. Now, uh, let's see. I think I got a question here. Let me see. Well, <laughs> yeah. So with that said, you know, hopefully that that makes sense. Um, how to train. Uh, let's see. So how to performance manage coordinators and closers. So you want to have end of day reports, and we use Screenshot Monitor. So Screenshot Monitor is just a time tracking tool. You want to mention that up front from the interview. You will be using screenshot monitor. Don't try to use some sort of mouse jiggler or whatever because it's going to notify if you're trying to, you know, jiggle the mouse or make, you know, some sort of uh, gaming the system for hours. Most closers, they, they do want uh, some hourly. They want a little bit of, you know, some certainty as to what they're, they're going to be making. And they will want some some bonus, you know, commission as well uh, from three to 10 percent. You know, the market will tell you. So if you start interviewing and you start making offers that are too low, uh, they're probably going to have somewhere else to go. Right. I think it's, you know, those averages that I'm giving you guys here are uh, are pretty acceptable, pretty, pretty much up to date from what I see in the marketplace. If you go too low, the issue is that they'll probably find something else eventually and then just, you know, go ahead and leave. OK, now, with that said, <clears throat> going back to kind of the process here. If you are yet to really, you know, start thinking, it's it's never it's never too soon to start thinking, even if you're solo and you're doing everything, you know, even if you're doing absolutely everything yourself, you you need to start thinking, OK, you might want to start thinking like, hey, is this a coordinator task? Is this a closer task? Is this a this I'm not covering this full sales manager? Because that's probably kind of like the last role that you want to kind of give up because a sales manager, you are approving the contracts that are coming in and you're approving the sales contracts that are going out. Right. And so, you know, in terms of hiring, um, coordinator should be the, the first one to try and buy back your time without affecting closing ratios. After, you know, you have your sales that are more consistent, then you can start, you know, hiring um, or, you know, getting people to start doing some closing because they're going to need some ramp up time. and There's going to be some marketing dollars um, that are spent, right? The better job you do at preparing and onboarding the closer and spending and investing time with them, the faster they're gonna ramp up. 
most of these closers, they're probably not going to ramp up on their own. They're going to need handholding. They're going to need training. They're going to need practice. And so you need both the contact time with them and the leads and the feedback and just empowering them, giving them, uh, you know, the okay, the green light. Obviously, they don't want to get fired, but giving them the okay, hey, we're going to fail forward together. You're going to go ahead and get, you know, get going. And I've had people from all age ranges, all sorts of backgrounds, you know, come in and 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 do well. Um, the English has to be good because it's phone sales, right? For the most part. So that's another piece that I didn't cover. The English has to be uh, pretty good because I mean, depending on where you're at in the country, um, you know, if they're hard to, you know, hard to uh, quote unquote understand, then it may be, you know, a little bit, a little bit tough, a little bit tough. Um, and I'll leave you guys with this and you probably have seen this before, but this is a philosophy that I share with, um, with my team members and, you know, it's something that anybody can implement. And I learned this from, from a book, uh, buy back your time and, 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 uh, Dan Martell, and it's a one, three, one mindset. Uh, and, you know, I always want people to come in and understand that there's always something to do. And there's always an area to improve and we should not be victims of our circumstances or lack of knowledge. We can always be resource resourceful. And so the one through one mindset is all about, hey, there's one problem. Think of three possible solutions. Recommend one final solution after investigating further. This goes to life in general, not just this role. Don't be a victim of self-doubt. Use the resources at hand because they can get overwhelmed with the resources, right? And so the idea is that they come up with good, smart questions, not lazy questions. And I will tell you that like culture and having a mission statement and the core values really sets the tone for people to give them the power to make decisions, right? Make decisions and actually give you your time back. So, um, with that said, I think we've covered the agenda for today. Do you guys have any other questions that I, that you guys want me to cover, go over? Perhaps it was a little fast. I'm going to click allow to talk. If you guys want to uh, talk or have any follow-up questions, I'll be happy to, to answer them uh, for you. Let's see. I can even bring you guys as panelists too, I think. Give you guys a minute. If not, we'll get on with our day. Okay. All right. I think. Cool. All right. Well, hopefully that was uh that was useful for you guys. Um, again, you'll see a new course loaded in the community. Let me know uh, once you see the post, what sort of questions, follow-ups you guys have, and I'll be happy to, you know, follow up with, uh, with those for you. Appreciate y'all's time. Take care.